Shalom, shalom, everyone. Welcome to Savers in the Tanakh. Shout out to Ross for holding it down, Tanisha and Lewis in the building. And we're going to get right into it, dealing with King David and Hezekiah today. So a lot of people are not aware that um, saviors and messiahs also can be saved. They need saving. So let's go right into it. Psalm 146, 1 through 3. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Footnote from the KJV. Psalm 146 and 3, instead of help, that word is salvation. So there is no salvation in the son of man. So how can they really be called saviors? Well, they are given salvation. That's how it works. So we're going to talk about David and Hezekiah and how they both can be looked at. Well, for sure, they were messiahs. They were anointed kings. So they were for sure messiahs. And they both were saviors. And we're going to show you how that came to be. 2 Samuel 22, 1 through 3. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had saved him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I shall trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. Not from boogeymen or spirits and demons <laughs> and, and all these like, other what? things, from violence. So we see over and over again, since I started the series, salvation comes in a time of trouble from physical things, people, floods, armies, you know, things of this nature. Um, even back in the um, story of Exodus, some of the Egyptians were saved from the plagues because it says that uh, all those who feared the Lord brought their animals inside and they didn't catch the parts of that plague. So we see salvation for David is from his enemies and from violent people. And it even says when he, the, when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, where, where, do, where are we told that David had, to fight demons and devils and spirits in high places. He's dealing with people the whole time. Now, can we say these people had wicked spirits? Their spirit was evil. Okay, let's, let's go there. They're still on the ground fighting with David. So, yeah, you can have a, a wicked person whose spirit, if you want to use the term spirit or his soul, was an evil soul. Okay. But we're still dealing with people here. So let's do some more salvation. Psalm 22 and 51. He is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. So if David is telling you in his, in his song that the Most High is the tower of his salvation and he's getting mercy and he's already a Messiah. This just shows you the humility and what David recognized. Even as a warrior, he still needed salvation. He know it wasn't him that was fighting these people and winning. It was the Most High helping them. Even when he fought Goliath, he says, you know, you come to me with javelin and sword or spear or something like that, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. So he knew he wasn't the one behind that victory. Isaiah 43 and 11, even I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. So we know that the Most High uses people to save people. We see in the Exodus, he used Moses. We see time and time again in the book of Judges, he used Othniel, Gideon. In the flood, he used Noah. To save Lot, he used Abraham. I mean... It's, it's pretty crystal clear of who's really behind these acts. Isaiah 45 and 21. 
tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from the ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord, and there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior, and there is none besides me? Hosea 13 and 4. Yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. I don't know how many times you got to say something to get your point across, but it's crystal clear. Hello, Diana. Thanks for joining us. So David saves the city of Keilah. Then David, then they told David saying, look, second, I'm sorry, this is in um, 1 Samuel uh, 23. Um, it says, then they told David, saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and they are robbing the threshing floors. So we got people who are, who are doing damage to, the, to um, uh, David's people. They are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. It doesn't say anything about saving them from their sins. But David's men said to him, look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And David inquired of the Lord once again. So David's men are thinking about themselves fighting this battle. But what does David do? He goes to the source. And the Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So again, we see physical salvation dealing with an army in a time of trouble. This is the theme of the Tanakh. This is, is, is so constant. Second Samuel 3 and 18. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of all their enemies. So we see they're saved from enemies, not their sins. Their sins is what got them in trouble in the first place. That's why they're being attacked by their enemies and being overcome. That's why they're going into captivity. This is one of the reasons Israel constantly had to cry to the Most High to be saved. So they're not getting saved from their sins. They were punished for their sins. Is why their enemies were able to overtake them. Then they cry to God, and he sends them salvation via whoever the anointed person is at that time. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. So we got persecution and salvation. Psalm 7 and 1. A meditation of David. When he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite, O oh Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. We know David was chased around by Saul for a while. And Saul didn't get to David. David had a chance to get to Saul. And even David had respect for the Messiah of the time. Even though David himself was anointed, he wasn't the king yet. And what did he say? I will not touch, touch the Lord's anointed. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. And we're going to show a concept that it's played around with. The words are, it's, it's, it's wordplay. Saved in the name of somebody or saved for the sake of somebody. Second Kings 19, 32 through 35. Therefore, thus said the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000, and when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So for the sake of David was the people saved. He says, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, 
did Hezekiah and the people have to pray in David's name? Nope. Did they have to offer any blood? Nope. Did David have to um, become a god to them? Nope. But for David's sake, the people were spared because we know the Most High made promises to David. We're going to read about that promise, but David had the merit to have his name used in the salvation, but it wasn't David who saved anyone in the situation. It was his merit, basically his account. He had a good credit account with God, right? <laughs> he, had, he had an 800 score, right? Zechariah 12 and 7, the Lord will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem should not become greater than that of Judah. Because we see Judah always got to be the kings, right? We know that the, the, the scepter will not depart from Judah. So even in Zechariah, in one of the final battles, Judah will be saved first. Psalm 89, 33 through 35. Nevertheless, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. We know there was a covenant made with David for this house of Judah. He passed this on to Solomon. First Kings 2, 1 through 4. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. See, he's very specific. The kings of Judah have to follow the law of Moses, not a gospel, the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me. There goes that promise saying, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth. We know that the Torah is truth. Psalm, uh, what is that? Psalm 142, your law is truth. With all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. This is why Hezekiah was saved in his kingdom, because Hezekiah was a faithful person. He was righteous. And so as long as he was righteous, the Most High could not dethrone him and let the king of Assyria come and overtake it because of this promise that he made to David. As long as they keep the Torah, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now, what's interesting about this is if people want to still put Jesus in the shoes of David being a son of David, right? He's a son of David. Why didn't he take the throne of David? John 6, 15, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. He ran. If you're the son of David, why is Herod on your throne? What's going on? It gets better. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Where's David's throne at? Is it in another world? Which, which son of David are you? Because David's throne is in Jerusalem, as far as I remember. Jeremiah thirty three seventeen. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now, when he's talking to Pilate, they in Israel, right? So where is his kingdom at? Because David's kingdom is in Israel where Pilate and Herod was ruling over. So something's wrong there. I hope everybody's taking notes. Something is wrong with the picture here. Psalm 140 and 1, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men. Here a Psalm of David, David is talking about being saved from people all the time, from people, from people, from people, deliver me from violent men, from evil men. So we see the savior needs salvation. He is not divine and he's not going to have divine children. 
We know in Psalm 89 says, if your sons disobey me, I will punish them. So if God is the son of David in the form of Jesus, God's got the possibility to be punished. Come on, y'all. Let's, let's really put this together. Psalm 144 and 10. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. So salvation is given to kings. They do not have it. They do not have it. It's not theirs. Remember, don't put your trust in the man whom there is no salvation. We read that in Psalm 146. So there's a verse that is so misquoted and read out of context. And of course, this is due to either misteaching or just lack of knowledge. Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. And by the way, I got a whole lecture on this. Um, um, I don't know if it's on the TV yet, but I will post it either tonight or tomorrow. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation. So people say, see right there, it says he's have, he has salvation. No, he is given salvation. We read this over and over and over again. In context, how many times have we just read that he gives salvation to his kings? David's begging for salvation. There is no salvation in the son of man. So he is just in having salvation because it's given to him. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fall of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. See, this is where they stop. They stop at verse nine uh, after the donkey. But what, what's the context? I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. When was the battle bow cut off? He shall speak peace to the nations. When did that happen? His dominion shall be from sea to sea. Oh, his kingdom ain't part of this world. What happened? And from the river to the ends of the earth. So if Jesus' kingdom is not part of this world, he can't be the one sitting on that donkey speaking peace to the nations and being your salvation. He can't be your king because he ain't free. His, his, his kingdom ain't got nothing to do with where we at. I'm going to read it again, John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Well, this king in Zechariah 9, his dominion is from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. Now, if that's not where we at right now, then somebody wake me up. Ross, somebody get over here and do some CPR because I thought, I thought I was on earth today. So having salvation? No, it's given to the king. Always. Always the king is given salvation. In the end times, we know there's going to be a temple. And that temple symbolizes many, many things. But there's going to be sacrifices. So to show you that the Messiah is not coming to save anybody from their sins, let's put some things in context. First, you need a, a, a temple to give sacrifices. And what are sacrifices for? Well, let's deal with it. Ezekiel 37, 24 through 28. David my servant shall be king over them and they shall have all one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them, not just have faith. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, the kingdom that's part of this world. I don't know what John 18, 36 is talking about, but the land that I've given to Jacob, where did he give Jacob some land at? Was it somewhere else? Where your fathers dwelt. <laughs> And they shall dwell there, not in some other place. They and their children and their children's children. Oh, uh, you're not going to get married and have ki ki uh, kids in, uh, according to the gospels in the future, right? You're going to be like angels. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst not talking about your body being the temple. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. 
This is not talking about your body being the temple. This is a physical temple in the land of Israel where Jacob was given his promise, like it says earlier, where your fathers dwelt. And the nations will know, not believe. People are not going to believe there's a temple in Israel. They're going to know it. Now, why is this important? Going back to the job of a Messiah. Is he coming to save you from your sins? Or is he coming to put justice in the earth? What's going to happen with your sins? It, well, let's, let's deal with Israel first. Because we know the Gentiles are going to go to, up to the mountain to learn the law. Isaiah chapter 2, right? All the, the 10 men from the 10 nations are going to say, we've heard God is with you. So we got to go see what's up with Israel. But what about Israel and their sins? The Messiah will not save you from your sins. Ezekiel 45, 20 through 22. And so, and so you shall do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you shall make atonement for the temple. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall observe the Passover, a feast of seven days, unleavened bread shall be eaten. And on that day, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land, a bull for a sin offering. If the Messiah is going to save people from their sins, why is he giving a sacrifice for himself and the people for a sin offering? Shouldn't his presence cleanse you or his blood cleanse you? What's this bull sacrifice from the prince? Because who else could this prince be? So people can argue, oh, it's talking about the priest. Well, according to the New Testament, Jesus is the high priest. So he's given himself a sacrifice for his sin. See, they, they, can't, they can't play this game right here. Either Jesus is the prince or he's the priest. Either way, this person is given a sacrifice for himself and the people for a sin offering. In the book of Hebrews, it says Jesus is the last sacrifice. So what happens right here? Is Ezekiel ignored? What happened? When, when did this happen? So the Messiah is not going to save you from your sins. He's going to come and bring a sacrifice. And we know when the temple stood, Solomon offered sacrifices for all the nations. Go and do some research. This prince in Ezekiel also will give an inheritance. Ezekiel 37 and 25. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. There goes that land where the fathers dwelt. <laughs> and they shall dwell in there. They, their children, and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. Ezekiel 46, 16 through 17. Thus says the Lord God, if the prince gives a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, it shall belong to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. But if, he give, but if he gives a gift of some of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his until the year of liberty, after which it shall, be, it shall return to the prince. But if his inheritance shall belong to his sons, it shall become theirs. Excuse me. So again, if we're talking about who is this prince, if it's Jesus, he's supposed to have some kids and he's supposed to give a sacrifice for himself. If he's the king or the priest, either way, either way you want to, you know, put your head around that. This, this prince will have kids and he will be given a sacrifice. The king Messiah's life is spared without blood. So we're going to deal with Hezekiah real fast. One of the sons of David. A Messiah. And we're going to show how <clears throat> Hezekiah played a role of a savior as well. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out in the middle of court, in the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer 
I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you on the third day. You shall go to the house of the Lord. So where was the blood? And we see a Messiah, an anointed king, son of David, being saved from praying and crying. He was told he was going to die. Get your house together. Make sure you got your insurance policy paid up. Your, pre your premiums paid up. You're going to die. But that didn't happen. We know he was given an extension of life because he prayed to God and he cried. No blood. A Messiah, by the way. So here's Hezekiah getting healing for the people from a prayer. Second Chronicles 30, 18 through 20. For a multitude of the people, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulon, had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, may the good Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to see God and the Lord of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. We see a Messiah praying for people to get atoned for and to heal them. And the Lord listened. Doesn't say he gave a sacrifice. He prayed and God listened to him. So we see a Messiah who can pray to God and God will listen to him to, hate, to save and heal people. Not, to, not only to save people, as we've seen you know, in previous chapters, but to simply heal them to purify them so they can eat the Passover without any problems, according to the purification of the sanctuary. So over and over again, we see salvation coming in a time of trouble. We see physical situations being dealt with. We see messiahs being saviors and messiahs getting saved. We see saviors getting saved. David was a savior. David had to get saved from armies. Hezekiah had these people atoned for. Hezekiah also had to get saved from the king of Assyria. We see the kingdom of David is on earth, not wherever John 18, 36 is trying to place it. So the kings of Judah are proven to be saviors and messiahs who are given salvation. And with that, we can open we can open it up for questions.